15th tax day uh, meeting, uh, town full meeting for the town of Austin. Please stand for the pledge. Good evening, everyone. 
My name is Melissa Bear. I'm the project supervisor for the consortium reassessment. And if you don't mind, I'm going to go stand up at the podium because I think otherwise my head will keep turning so I can see where we are in the presentation. MMRC, Multiple Municipal Reassessment Consortium. The consortium, as you've heard, is made up of the town of Austin, Greenberg, and the city of Yonkers. They joined together for cost savings to have shared services to achieve a common goal. <coughs> so the group of us, all those towns in Tyler, will work together as a team for consistency, equity, and, and uh, fairness. That's our goal of a reassessment. So why do we do one of these, these things that is uh, difficult and maybe a little scary? We want fairness. So if each property owner is asked only to pay their fair share, we achieve fairness. When we value all properties at market value at the same time, we achieve equity. Another goal of ours is transparency. We want this process to be transparent, we want to educate the public, we want to have all the information that we use in our valuation, all of our property data, available to the public so that you can understand how we come to our values and how we came to your neighbor's values and how what is your neighbor's values as compared to yours because that's important for equity. So what are some of those fears of, of why we want to do a reassessment? We're going to pay more taxes. So a reassessment is revenue neutral. What that means is that no more taxes are, are generated from a reassessment. We merely redistribute what each person pays. So unlike what you may have heard, uh, if the budget stays exactly the same, then the amount of taxes that the town collects is exactly the same. Now, most of us have paid taxes long enough to know that budgets rarely stay the same. But if those two things stay the same, no more taxes would be generated. But each individual person may pay a different amount. So one of the questions that I often get is, what can we expect? There's a rule of thumb in our industry, a third, a third, and a third. A third of the people will see their taxes go down, a third will stay the same, and a third will go up. We recently completed a reassessment in the town of Scarsdale. Just a couple weeks ago, we issued the uh, new notices. What we found there were 25% went up, 38% went down, and the remainder stayed the same. So that wasn't really following the third, a third, a third, because it really depends how long since the last reassessment, what kind of shifts have happened in the market over 20, 30, 50 years. So the one third, one third is only a rule of thumb. It's going to be different, but it's something to, to get started. We won't know until the very end of the project what those uh, shifts are going to be. So the government will spend more. That's kind of the same as the first one. So once again, it's revenue neutrals. No more taxes are generated just from a reassessment. <coughs> Discover unknown improvements. This probably depends on whether or not it's you or your neighbor who had that unknown improvement, but that is something that we certainly hope to achieve with a reassessment. Uh, some houses haven't been inspected in decades. So if people did some things without building permits, or perhaps there were improvements that didn't require building permits but increased the value of the property, we chances are we're going to find those. <coughs> Embarrassed by a messy house. Chances are our houses are just as messy, if not messier, than yours. Uh, we, we look at dozens, hundreds of properties over uh, the course of this project, and uh, one messy house isn't going to stick in our memory for sure. Uh, but all our data collectors are there to do is collect information, count the rooms, what's your heating type, that type of thing. So we don't take notes about it. Uh, being away when inspections occur. So we're going to talk a little bit about the process, but we will notify you approximately 10 days to a week ahead of time of what will be in your area so that you know that a data collector will be around. They will wear neon vests uh, with Tyler on them. So hopefully they will be easily identified. Uh, if you work, chances are the first time we visit your house, you won't be there. So we will make a second attempt. We're going to make that second attempt after five 
or on a Saturday. So I'll apologize ahead of time if we interrupt your dinner or your birthday party on a Saturday, but we're doing everything we can to try to get all the information that we can so that we can promote fairness and equity. So getting into everybody's property is very important to the process. So here are the phases of the reassessment. We start off with the data collection. So that's where we are right now. Uh, we haven't started yet. We're going to start in a couple of weeks. We're going to be data collecting properties for approximately one year. So a data collector will come out. First, you'll get your letter. It'll have some information, some frequently asked questions. It'll give you some uh, contact information. So if you have any concerns or you have some questions ahead of time, feel free to give us a call, check out our website. All that information will be available on that notice. And that's your notification that we're going to be around. If you want to make an appointment with us, give us a call. We'll be happy to accommodate anybody who wants to make an appointment for a specific time and date for us to do this inspection. If you are not home, someone will measure your, your, all of the structures, so your house, your outbuildings. Uh, so if one of your neighbors says there's somebody with a neon vest measuring your house, it's probably one of our data collectors. We're going to have pictures of all the people that are going to be working for Tyler their pictures, their car information will be available on the website. Everyone who works for Tyler will have a recent, as in the last week, background check. So we fully vet all of our employees to make sure that we have upstanding citizens coming out to do this work. I'm going to go into detail in each of these, so I don't want to go into too much. The next phase is the data analysis. So we're taking a look at sales, income information for commercial properties. We're going to work on that from May 2014. So we start right, right out of the gate. We want to start working on these values, see what the market's telling us. That goes on to July of 2015. Then we have the valuation review and informal meetings phase. That's when we actually send an appraiser out with your property card and the comparables that have been selected for your property. And they're out there to make sure that the value is accurate, reasonable, and equitable with your neighbors. Once that's done, we'll notify you of your assessment, and you'll have the opportunity to meet with an appraiser from Tyler to explain the process and specifically your property, and that will happen um, in September 2015 for the review. We'll send notices about March 1st, 2016, and then we'll have that informal process in the month of March and April. So data collection. Collection is a pretty big deal. What we do is called mass appraisal, and we build models to, to estimate the fair market value to achieve the value for your property. It's different from what you may be familiar with if you've ever had an appraisal done for mortgage purposes or to sell your house, where a, a fee appraiser will come out and select properties that are comparable to yours, and they're only concerned with your property alone. So they're not looking to make sure that the value that they're putting on your neighbor's property is equitable or fair. Um, so what we do is we value every single property, properties that don't sell, churches, schools, that type of thing. We have to develop models that are used. And what this does is gives us consistency. So every property is, is uses the same rates and methods so that we can make sure that if this house is identical to this house, it's going to have the same value generated. So the data collection is what's going to drive that, those models. It's all built on data. Now some of that data is subjective, but we try to focus on the things like square foot of living area, things that if we send five people out, five people will get the same answer. That promotes consistency, because it's difficult when you think about what people want when they buy a house. Everybody wants something a little different. If you've got children, you may need four bedrooms. If you're at a retirement stage, maybe you want a small yard. So everybody's motivated a little bit differently. And what we're trying to do is, is kind of make a science out of that. Um, so we try to stick to some of the, the things we can count more so than, uh, you know, this is, this is a fabulous kitchen or something along those lines. So we're going to send you a pre-data collection mailing. We're going to take the exterior measurements, so we are going to measure um, all the, the uh, size of your house, any outbuilding that you have. Uh, we're going to ask you to do an interior inspection. An inspection lasts about five to ten minutes, depending on how large your property is. So we start in the basement if you have one. Uh, we're going to 
take a look to see if there's any fish in that basement. We're going to see what kind of heat system you have. We're going to count the number of rooms. And that's about it. We don't look at the artwork. We don't look at your furnishing, your appliances. Um, so we're, we're strictly collecting pieces of information. The people coming out to your house are not appraisers. They're not going to be able to talk to you about the value of your property or what might happen to the, the assessment on your property. They're just there to collect data. Hence the title of data collector. Once the data is collected, we do quality control. We have what we call group leaders. For every group of data collectors, there will be one supervisor. That person may come back to do a quality check. So you may end up having another person come to your house. And again, we apologize for the inconvenience of that, but quality is really important to us. We want to make sure that the people we have doing this are doing it accurately and consistently. So we have a whole control, quality control program. And once that is done, we'll send you a data memo. So we want you to review what we have on your property. Let us know if there are any issues with it. That will give you another opportunity if we missed you the first two times um, to, to let us in to do that interior inspection. And uh, we'll also send you a postcard. If we didn't get you the first two times, we're going to send you another opportunity to let us in. It's that important to us to do that interior inspection. So we want to give everyone an ample opportunity to make the appointment that's convenient to you. And we will offer night in uh, Saturday appointments. Next, we do the data analysis. So we start off by looking at properties that are sold. So how do we determine what your property is worth? Well, we look at properties that are similar to yours and what they sold for. So that's the basis of our models for residential properties. For commercial properties that don't sell as frequently, we have another method called the income, the income method. So we take what a building would rent for, uh, how how much vacancy they have. So if you get a strip plaza and they got one of their stores empty, that affects how much money they get. We look at the expenses to run that building, electric, uh, snow plows, that type of thing. And then we take that and divide it by a rate, and that generates the value. So for any commercial property owners, we're going to ask you to submit income and expense information. And that information is very important to us to be able to come up with accurate values. The next thing we do is neighborhood delineation. So most of you probably think of a neighborhood, and, and you maybe got some names for them, Briarcliff and, and such. Our neighborhoods are evaluation neighborhoods. So they consider things such as zoning, school districts, uh, and then what amenities are close by. Sometimes it's the train station, a highway. We take all these things factors and we determine where the to draw the lines of similar properties. So we want to compare your property to the ones that are similar to yours, the ones that have the similar housing stock. So if you're in a neighborhood of mainly 70s built houses, the chances are your neighborhood is going to be made of similar properties. Um, the next part is the valuation model, which I talked a little bit about. So we have our data-driven valuation model. So we use a computer-assisted mass appraisal system, and we model to try to estimate the fair market value. So the reason we use sales is because the sale price is equal to fair market value in most cases. So we test our models against all the properties that have sold, and then if we do a good job, then we'll have some statistical tests that will verify that that model is accurately predicting a fair market value for the properties where we know what the fair market value is. We then take those very same models and we apply them to all the properties that have been sold. So here's some statistics. I don't get into too heavy in statistics. I will do a meeting at some point where I will bore you a little bit with these statistics. So these are just some things that you, you probably know already if you've lived here long enough. And these are just the, uh, the home sales and what the median price is. Um, so you can see down here it's 700,000, over there it's 300,000. So these two would never be one valuation neighborhood. These are obviously two very different locations. They're indicating that properties in zip code 10510, I think that's Briar Club, uh, are more valuable than in Austin. So that's just one example. And we do many, many stratifications of this type of information. We look at 
sales by year, sales by location, all different types of stratification. So the next part is the valuation review. We do a final review. We do more statistical testing. We do a lot of statistical testing because at the end of the day, we're committed to accurate values. We want to do everything we can to identify what things in the market are driving what people pay for properties. We're going to document everything. We're going to make as much of that available as we can in the effort for transparency. So there will be book about this big that will explain our methodology in detail and what the rates we use, what land values we use in certain areas, uh, how much a deck is worth, how much a garage is worth, that type of thing. All of that will be available. And then there are the formal meetings. So I, I encourage you, if you're displeased with your assessment, to make an appointment, even if you just want information. Make an appointment, meet with one of our appraisers so we can explain the process and go over your property specifically. What comparables do we use? If there are no comparables, because there will be properties that we don't have any sales like them. So we use a, an alternative approach called the cost approach. We'll explain that too. So please take advantage of that. And then if you, you don't have to go to our informals, you can always go to the grievance day. Um, but hopefully you'll come to see us first because a lot of times we can get those things worked out before you have to go on to a formal. So a quality-driven process equals quality results. That's, that's what we shoot for. That's what our goal is. So we got quality data collection, which includes the quality control uh, that I talked about, a detailed analysis and modeling. We'll get accurate valuation review and hearings, and that will give us, hopefully, fairness, equity, and transparency. And now I'd like to open it up for questions. That is our web address. Please check it out. We've spent a lot of time working on it, or it's going to be a, a great resource for all of you. We'll have press releases. We'll have uh, street listings, so you'll know where we are at any given time, where our data collectors are located. Uh, presentations such as this one will be available. <coughs> When you have the slide about the 10562 home sale prices versus the 10510, you're going to take into consideration that some people who have the 10510 zip code don't really live there, right? Yeah, zip code isn't something that we actually uh, take into consideration. Um, it's where your mail comes from. Other than that, we take a look at school districts. We take a look at, you know, the, the neighborhoods have really nothing to do with zip codes and mailing addresses and that type of thing. So um, we're going to look at sales that are most similar to yours, that are closest to your location. Uh, that's our ideal. Anyone else? I'm going to kind of answer that question from a pure appraisal standpoint, and then I'm going to ask Fernando to talk about the other aspect of the condos. Uh, from a market value standpoint, not, not anything to do with homestead or anything like that, we treat condos pretty much the same way. We will do a market analysis. We typically stay within your complex um, if there are a, enough sales to do so. If they're not, then we may have to try to find complexes that are similar and use those for comparables. But uh, yeah, we use the same thing. We, we look at square footage. A lot of times we'll look at, we, we try to determine what's driving the value. Why are people paying so much for this one as opposed to this one? Some of those reasons are interior unit versus exterior unit, what floor you're on, depending on the view you have. So while the, the individual data elements that we use for the valuation may differ somewhat, the process itself is similar. So what, what 
you're not gonna have land in a condo. That's probably the biggest thing. So, so um, but no, there's still a location. There's no that, real value to the, the condominium as a whole. You're just valuing the units, is that? Correct. From a purely appraisal standpoint. Now I'm gonna give it to Fernando. The, uh, any of the other members if they want to add to the, to the answer of the, the, the microphone. But under the current New York State law, we have to assess condominium units <coughs> based on the income approach. Uh, for this revaluation process, we will be doing both, establishing a value based on the income approach, as if they were apartment buildings, and establishing a value based on the market approach. The issue of the Homestead will be addressed late, later on uh, after the analysis is done and we are able to present the facts to the uh, members of the uh, town board and the village board to make a decision whether the homestead will be adopted or not. But that will be an issue that we will be discussing at length uh, later on in the process. Didn't you just say the homestead has to be you? I'm sorry? Didn't you just say the law requires the homestead view? No. No. The, what I said is that under the current law, the condominiums are assessed based on the income approach. In order to establish the homestead, and I will defer to John Rowland, uh, an analysis has to be done and it would have to be adopted by the town board or the school board or the village board. Maybe you could say more. I didn't follow what's going on. Thank you. Yes, the uh, Fernando is correct. Essentially, there is a legal option in New York State known as homestead. In the event that the town were to adopt homestead, it allows condominiums that would be classified as homestead to be valued on a market basis as opposed to the income basis. But what Fernando is saying is absolutely correct. The information by which the town could make an informed decision as to whether homestead is really appropriate for use in the town of Ossining, that's not going to be known until such time as the folks from Tyler have finished their work and preliminary assessed values are available for all property. That's why, as Fernando said, in order to do that analysis, the folks from Tyler will be establishing both income-based values for individual condominium units and market-based values. Uh, homestead tends to, get, can, tends to become a bit complicated, and if the town is seriously interested in considering that, as time, go, as time goes on, because this project is looking at a 2016 implementation, so my guess would be sometime in the latter part of 2015 on, there would be a number of sessions to discuss the homestead option in greater detail at the behest of the town board so that both the board members as decision makers and members of the public would have a better understanding of what goes into it and how potentially it would affect uh, not just condo owners, but owners of all property in the town of Austin. So it's an option that's up to the board at the end. That is absolutely correct. It is an option. Uh, it is not something the town has to necessarily choose to do. But, but hasn't done it. The current, the current valuations are, are income based? Yes, the, current in, the question was, uh, are the current valuations income based? And the gentleman is correct. Right now, the assessments on the town's role for all condominiums are income based. The only way that a municipality can assess condominiums on a market basis, and I hasten to add only those condominiums that are classified as homestead, and I won't go into that in greater detail unless somebody really wants to know at this point, but the only way condominium units could be assessed on a market basis would be for the town to adopt homestead. The reason that has not been considered or couldn't even have been considered up to this point is that in order to adopt homestead, a municipality must 
successfully conduct and implement a reassessment. So this is really the first opportunity the town will have to consider this. And again, a decision would be made in advance of implementation for the town's 2016 project. Anyone else? questions there. <clears throat> Let me take the second one first. Uh, this lady is really asking about the classification process. What would allow some condominiums to be classified as homestead versus non-homestead? Quite simply, as simply as I can say it, any condominium that was built as a condominium or condominiums that were converted from any use other than apartments, rental apartments, or cooperative apartments, any condo that fits that description would potentially be classified as homestead. Any condominium that was converted from a rental apartment or a cooperative apartment would be classified as non-homestead. Now the distinction, which is what I think this lady is getting at, is that condominiums that are classified as homestead in a municipality that adopts homestead, those condominiums, again, the homestead classified condominiums would be assessed on a market value basis. So right now, if you were to take a condominium and develop a value based on the income it would rent, if it were being rented as, say, an apartment, and you go through a capitalization process, which is something Melissa referred to in her discussion of what Tyler would be doing for commercial properties, you, you get a value estimate, and if you compare that to what the condominium unit would actually sell for as an arm's length sale in an open market, as if it were a one family home, you would typically find that the selling price, the market value, is going to be noticeably higher than the value indicated by the income approach. Typically, you might find that the market value could be anywhere from about a third to maybe 50% higher. It really depends on the individual properties, the complexes involved, the markets being considered. But as a general rule of thumb, the market value of individual condo units is generally higher than an income produced value. So to get at your first question, if Homestead were to be adopted, the condominiums that are, or that would be classified as homestead would likely produce more assessed value to the town's role than in the absence of the adoption of homestead. And that's the best way I can answer it at this point in time. Again, more would really have to wait until we get to that point in time in the project in early 2016 when all the facts and figures are available about preliminary assessments for all properties, including both kinds of value estimates for all condominiums. Hi. Um, can I ask? Uh, you need to put up in the mic. You need to pass the microphone. Uh, thanks for being here tonight. Uh, we appreciate you, your uh, assisting us in this. Um, why not, since the uh, since both the uh, market and income varieties are being studied simultaneously, why not just create some sort of a hybrid that allows you to take both into account, so that it's not an either or, but a both? 
because it, it seems to me that would be more fair and equitable. Yeah, that's a great question. The answer is simply that the law that governs the homestead tax option, and homestead is a tax option, not an assessing option, that law does not presently allow what you're suggesting. And that would take an act of the legislature to change what's known as Article 19 of the Real Property Tax Law. It's the simplest answer I can offer you. Anyone else? Are the property still evaluated? The property still evaluated as of some date? I mean, some sort of a logical equivalent of a taxable status date? Yes. And if so, what's that date? July 1st, 2015. 2016. 15. Yeah, that's what we call our data value. So that's what we'll. Uh, we'll use as our moment in time. When we appraise value, we're trying to capture just a moment in time. Uh, the market is always changing, and so that's our date. And we'll look at properties that have sold for two years prior to that date. Can you explain that a little bit more? Sure. So uh, whenever you do appraisal, you have to have a data value. You have to know what the basis of your market information is going to be. So what period of time are you going to analyze for sales data? Now, that doesn't mean that we'll ignore any sale that happens after July 1st, 2015, because honestly, those are the sales that test our models the best. So how good of a job did we do when we developed our models? The ones that we don't know about yet. So those are the ones that are going to really test our models. So I don't mean to say that we'll ignore them, but the basis of our information, how we're going to build our models, is based on July 1st, 2015. So if the market continues to change after that day, we're not going to reflect it. But we are going to use two years in arrears of sales information. So we're kind of looking backwards and not forward. So some one of the questions I got the other night was, well, this particular neighborhood is in a bubble. Well, we don't really think of it that way. We look at properties two years. If your property is in a neighborhood that's selling very high, then your assessment is going to reflect that. If your neighborhood is, in, is not selling very well, then your assessment is going to reflect that. So we don't look forward. We don't try to predict what the market's going to do. Uh, we leave that to the real estate agents. So that snapshot in time, July 1st, 2015, is what we're going to base it on. Another unrelated question. Okay. Um, is, what does experience show about the relation what happens to uh, appeals to the Board of Assessment Review after following a evaluation? Do, do the appeals go down? Do they stay down for a year, five years, ten years? Generally what happens is people are motivated by the success of an appeal. So if you have a lot of appeals that are being successful, then it's going to encourage other people to appeal. And the only way to really stop them is to take have a value that's defensible or have a set of values that are defensible. And that's what we propose to do. So what you may see right after the reassessment, uh, I can tell you in Scarsdale, commercial properties were, were affected um, more so than the residential. They went up a lot more than the residential base. Now, that's only 70 properties in Scarsdale. So, um, but depending on how they're assessed now, if they're under assessed now, they may see a bigger jump and that may generate some appeals. But our hope is that and it, this takes, takes some cooperation with the, the people making those decisions, but that will have the information and the data. So these are current assessments. These aren't assessments based 50 years ago. This is based on data that we will be able to supply. We're gonna have, you know, this is what a property like this rents for. This is what a property like this sells for. So what we're hoping is that we will be able to make the argument that our assessments are correct and fair and that those appeals will stop being successful and then people are not going to invest the money into getting a reduction in their taxes. That's really the only way to stop the appeals. But I, in our experience, we still see some, some appeals right after the assessment and then they start to drop off. And the more frequently, you, if you wait another 50 years, you're probably gonna end up in the same boat. But you, you know, so if you can keep up your assessments and keep that data current, uh, you know, over time, those appeals are going to go down considerably. I live in Connecticut. I most of my experience is in Connecticut. We do reassessments every five years in Connecticut, and our uh, appeal rates um, 
we're in a little bit of a down market there. So we get about 1%. If we get more than 5%, that's a tremendous uh, outcome. So we're, you know, we're, we've been doing this a long time. We don't have a lot of appeals. Uh, we generally see the same, same people coming to court, stop and shop, target, not to mention any names. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so the ones that have the money to appeal. But overall, I think, you know, in Massachusetts, it's the same thing. We do them annually, and the appeals go down because they're just not successful. It's not worth it for them to, to have an attorney or, or get an appraisal to appeal it. Thank you. I just wanted to add to that that we will have values that will be more defensible. We will have a data. We have a role that will allow us to rigorously defend the assessment. And in the event, Usually the first year you end up with a slightly higher rate uh, of uh, assessment grievances. Uh, but the ultimate result is that the payout will be less because the differences will be that much closer. And of course, as time goes on and we continue to maintain the role, at full value, the, the percentage of appeals will diminish. Any other questions? earlier, uh, the sort of difference in valuation perhaps in your house of what you think it was as opposed to what your neighbors is. And of course, living in the village, having purchased a home in 1988, it was a two-family house that housed 26 people plus the family that owned the house. This sort of brings all kinds of images to my mind as far as what's going to happen down in some of the areas of the communities. As far as when you go into a house to get a valuation, you find a two-family house has five kitchens. Um, could you? Sure. Uh, um, we're not the permit or the planning police. We list properties as we see them. If there are five living units, and we define all of these things. So in our in our manual for the people that are going out, we define what a living unit is. Um, kitchen be one of the, the factors. We're going to call it a five-family. We don't. We don't know if it's legally a five-family. We can suspect that it's not a legal five-family. So we have to value it as it stands. Now, in reality, if that person goes to, tries to sell that property, they may not be be able to legally sell that as a five-family. But that's how we treat it, because you know that's all we can do. We, you know, it's not up to us whether it's legal or not. So, in your history of doing this before, there hasn't been an influx of activity for the zoning. In, in, your, in your history of doing, this, of doing this in other communities, as a result, there hasn't been a, 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 a dramatic increase in appearances before the zoning board for variances? I've never tracked this, to be honest. Okay. Um, you know, my, my job is to, to appraise properties, and, and it really depends on how much cooperation and, and how much sharing of information there is. Um, you know, my important, for me, I, I want to be able to get into every every property, and, and I'm not going to go run down to the building department and, and tattle on anybody because that's counterproductive to, to what I want. Um, but our records are certainly open to the public and including the building official or planning official if they want to see. So it's, it's a tough one. It is because, you know, we just don't get into the legality. I mean, we, as you can imagine, we, my company have been in, you know, hundreds of thousands of houses, you can just imagine the things that we can see. Okay. I just want to add to that question that, uh, of course, that is, that is an issue that all reassessment, all municipalities that are undergoing a reassessment find that uh, there are not only illegal apartments, but also bathrooms that were done uh, without a permit, decks that were built without a permit. All of our information is shared with all the other departments in order to efficiently run government. However, this issue that we're talking about is already being addressed at some level through the sale. Right now, whenever someone is going to lease a house, part of the due diligence that is required of the realtor, the title company, and the, many times the appraiser, 
is to reconcile the differences between what is listed as the inventory of the house in MLS or what, it, what exists and what is there in, on the permit. So our uh, building departments are already dealing with those issues. And uh, uh, usually in the spring, there is an uptake of permit applications to legalize basement, bathrooms, etc. Any other questions? things that are very easy to collect 
and then our appraisers make a judgment on the quality of the construction and the condition of the house. Is that? Ultimately, we'll, we'll do a market model, which will drive the, how we select comparables and how we adjust. So you have a deck, a garage, all those things are important. What those final things that we use in our model, we haven't determined yet because we haven't decided, we haven't looked at the sales enough to know what things are driving the market. And once we do that, then we'll be able to answer that question much more specifically than I can right now. But those in general are, are what we look at. So if it, it affects you paying more for a property, then it's probably gonna affect your value. So if you think about reading a real estate ad, what are the things that they talk about in a real estate ad? Location, 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 size, number of bathrooms, size of the lot. Those are very much the same things that we're looking at. You're welcome. We'll have Mr. Haberman answer the question from the supervisor. What does the monitor do in a reassessment project? I'm sorry, Tom Donato. Hi. <coughs> As a monitor, our prime responsibility is to be the eyes and ears for the town. Okay? We'll do independent studies. We'll review the data okay, in the market. We'll send people out, collect our own data, and then we'll compare our results to what Tyler's results are to make sure they make sense. And if there's any type of difference between them, we'll discuss it with Tyler and the assessment department and come to a conclusion what should be used and what shouldn't be used, okay? So we're basically the eyes and ears of the town. Any other questions? Thank you. Um, so in terms of the re reliability of the income, uh, the data uh, collection, so I know there are cards on file. What, what um, formula do you use? Like if a card says the house was built in, you know, 1950, and, and there was, there's a permit, you know, records of a permit that the kitchen was updated in 1970 you know, or whatever. Do you take anecdotal information from a homeowner that says, oh, what, you know, no, we haven't done this, you know, this kitchen was done you know, a long time ago, or, you know, at what point do you challenge the credibility of the person giving the information? How do you, how do you find out when a kitchen was redone unless you're getting it from the court or from, the, from, uh, from a uh, homeowner? And that's just one example, you know, across the board, you know. Do you take other negative information? Like if somebody says, yes, my house is a great house, but you have no idea. At three o'clock in the morning, you know the the you know the the garbage operation next door really goes into full. You know it's noisy and it's smelly and you know. At what point do you take anecdotal information and actually build that into the uh, data collection? There's a couple things in there. Um, we would never challenge a homeowner. <laughs> we never say no. You did your kitchen last year. <laughs> no, we never do that. Um, we take all the information that's available. So if there are permits. That's a pretty good piece of information. It comes from the building department. We know it's, it's, it's verifiable. That's great. Because I don't remember. I've been working on my house for 10 years. I can't remember when I did my kitchen and when I did my garage. You know, So they may say, we've done it in the last 10 years, and you know we'll put it down. We have to estimate sometimes. We're not going to get in every house. So anything that's verifiable, we take that. And uh, as far as anecdotal, so uh, residential <coughs> valuation can be an emotional thing. So you have a neighbor who leaves garbage out, it's, that person is convinced that's gonna affect the value of the property. I can tell you from doing this job a long time, it, it probably doesn't, you can put a fence up and, and you know, that, that's all that's gonna happen. Because unless the person buying your property is aware of that situation, it's probably not gonna affect what they pay. So um, it's the appraiser's job, not the data collector. So we're going to take as many notes. So if somebody has something to tell us, you want to tell us that you know you've got a crack in your foundation, please tell us. We'll write it down. We'll have all those notes available to the appraiser who ultimately will make a judgment of whether we made some kind of adjustment to your property. If it's a, an external type of thing, you got a gas station in your backyard, we're going to be able to see that. But if it's on the inside of the house and you feel it's really important, please share it with us. It may end up that it doesn't impact the value the way you think it does, but we're going to do our best to analyze all of those factors. Because what it comes down to is the only way to determine how something affects the value of a property is to have 
a sale of a property that suffers from that same type of thing. And that could be, and, and it could be a positive factor or a negative factor. If you're overlooking a golf course as opposed to a landfill, we're gonna try to analyze the sales if we have them. And that's gonna give us our basis of whether something needs an adjustment. One of the things we get all the time, power lines. People are very emotional about power lines. So we're gonna identify all the properties that are affected by power lines, and we're gonna look at the sales. And whatever those sales tell us, this is the way we're gonna go. So that's how we determine. Now there may be sales. If you've got a gas station in your backyard, I can make a reasonable assumption that's going to negatively affect the value of your house, whether I have a sale that says that or not. But I'm going to have to make some kind of appraisal judgment from my own experience, from our appraiser's experience. What have we seen in other areas? 10%, 20%? And sometimes we have to base it on that if we don't have any sales of similar properties. So, um, did I get all of it? <laughs> yeah, those multiple questions are tough. This might be a simplified logistical question. So based on these questions, when I make an appointment for someone to come to my home um, and the, the data collector comes, will they already have the card, card, we call it card, whatever, paperwork that, from the assessor's office that exists about what my home, according to the assessor's office, has so that they're comparing to you know, to that information when they get in the house? Yes. <laughs> we never want to start from scratch. <laughs> we, we've actually had clients who have great data and want us to start from scratch. I never understand it. Uh, having data is good because, you know, why start from scratch when you've got something already? So what we have are these cards. They're from 1970s. 1970s. So they're handwritten cards, We've, they've been scanned. The data collector will have that, and they're gonna have all the information that is existing in your database already. So we're taking all that information, and we're putting all the pieces, the picture that we have, we're putting all that. So as much information as we have right now is what we're sending people out into the field with. So they will have that information, and we'll just you know adjust it as, as necessary. So hopefully, um, you know whoever did this, way back when, was really good at it, and we will have to make a lot of changes. But. One of the things that uh, we do encourage anyone that if they did do something without a building permit, to feel free to go to your local building department, whether it be the, un uh, in the unincorporated, you go to the town building department, the village building department, or uh, village of Austin building department, or the village of Briar building department. Um, the, uh, they do, the cars might be from 1972, but they do keep up with them, and they do put, every time that you go out for building permit, they do put what you did to your home. Let's say you put a deck on your home. Let's say you put a bathroom in your house, or something like that, and you didn't get a building permit. But we're just gonna encourage you to go get a, a building permit for that, because that, they'll see that on the card. And again, it's not that they are here to find these things, but this is open <coughs> data. Um, understand that when you go to that website, I went to it today, and uh, I pulled up my house, and uh, and it was very cool. And uh, it's not really the inside of my house or anything. It just shows my little my little block of house, um, you know, where it, where it is. So you'll be able to do that, and you'll but slowly but surely they'll fill it with information. Technology is a wonderful thing, and I'm sure they'll be using tablets. Or They're not going to carry around the cards with them. Oh yeah. The, 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 <laughs> Yeah, they're not, right? No, we yeah. Need, <laughs> I need the microphone. Yeah. Technology is good. Technology is wonderful. We would love to use tablets, but unless you have data to start with, you can't really put, you can't put a hard copy card onto a tablet. And um, tablets are still pretty expensive, so we are gonna use paper for the data collector. Yes, we are. Um, so. If we had a digital format or digital something, then there, there's a lot of um, technology out there that lets us change data on the fly. It goes back to the database like magic, and, and we don't have to do data entry or anything. Um, but because we are dealing with old PDFs of cards, 
Um, it, it doesn't really make sense to spend the money on a tablet that someone's basically going to do the same thing that we do with a pen and a piece of paper. Um, however, when we do the review, we will be using some technology for that. So when the review appraiser's out there, they'll have the access to that database, they'll have a GIS map, um, they'll have the information on your house, your neighbor's house, so they'll be able to do that type of thing. But for the data collection itself, they'll have, it's old school. Measuring tape, clipboard, piece of paper. Anyone who wants to ask a question from the audience, come on down, too. So, uh, two questions. I'll keep them separate. Uh, one, as far as that entry, eventually, though, there will be a software program that will have all the data entered. So that, that will be continuing updatable information on, on the software. Good. Um, and then, I, I think I know the answer to this already, but as far as old assessments go, this is a clean slate, right? You don't take an old assessment and say, oh, well, it used to be assessed at 10, and so we, we would assess it now at 15, but since it was once at 10, we'll, we don't want to jump five points, so we'll just go up. I mean, if you actually use current assessments for comparison purposes when you're uh, establishing a new assessment? I just want to go to the first one real quick. Uh, we will have, we are, part of this project is new software system, a new, what we call a CAMA system that, that the town is going to have after we're gone, so they can maintain all this information. Um, so when someone builds a new house, they'll be able to put Fernando put that information in and generate a value for years and years to come. And as part of that, our website, at, when that data is available, uh, all of that data for your house, your neighbor's house, every property in town will be available on the MMRC Tyler Tech website. So you'll be able to view the information. So when that data mailer gets mailed and you submitted your changes, you can go to the website within a reasonable amount of time and see that those changes have been made. If they're not made, you can give us a call. There may be a reason for it, um, or maybe it was just an oversight. So um, that data will be available. That's part of our transparency and a very important part of this project. The second thing. Um, I don't want to say unequivocally no, because old assessments are a piece of information. So they're not, you know, when they're as out of date as, as they are, they're not as meaningful as they may be in, in some other places where we've done them more frequently. But sometimes, if a property can never be built upon, you know, it's not a building lot, the assessment may give us a piece of that information that another piece of data didn't. If the assessment is so low because this is not a building lot, that, that's a piece of information. But generally, we don't look at I can tell you honestly, I never look at the old assessment. People ask me, what, is, what's the, what are they doing? People like yourselves, because that's what you want to know. What's the change going to be? I don't look until the very, very end. So I, it's a piece of information that we use like any other, like a bedroom counter or something like that. But it doesn't motivate us or, or cause us to go in a, a, a direction that that I don't want someone to, unfortunately, that, that's your burden to bear, frankly. Um, you know, I, I'm just going to give you it the way I give it to you, and how the shifts lie is, is what they're going to be. Um, so I don't really pay attention to, to whether something goes up 500%, and this goes down 500%, because at the end of the day, I'm just trying to estimate a fair market value with no regard to what the old assessment that was from a market many, many years ago. Um, you know, it just doesn't, it isn't pertinent today. Come on down. And Diane, do that. <laughs> this question is probably not for you, but more for them. Oh, okay. You already discussed the difference between condominiums being valued by income as opposed to as a homestead. Now, what is the situation for PUDs, for which there are many in the town of Austin? They are that they have condominium amenities, all kinds of shared services, many have private roads, many have to maintain different garbage schedule pickups and what have you, which would put them in a condominium category at the same time that they are being assessed as a single family. Um, John? Yeah, I'll answer that one. I mean, as far as valuation, we're just like a condo complex, we're going to try to value those as, as a, a type of property. So we're going to look at comparables of just those types of hubs and, and use our, the basis for our value of the sales of those types of properties. Uh, they may not, a, a sale of a, 
a regular single family home in a neighborhood next door doesn't necessarily give me the value of that property. But I don't know whether that has anything to do with the homestead. So I'll give that to John. So. No, I, Melissa's answer was very good. Uh, HUDs, as, to the best of my knowledge, are not considered condominiums legally. Right. Well, uh, plan. Yeah, plan. Yeah, I heard it's plan or but right. yeah, that, that's the way I would equate like that. It's a it's a development where there were certain amenities or or organizational structures inherent among the units in that. Many times they are attached and many times, you know, they have private roads that they have to maintain that are not being maintained by the municipality. Yeah. On the other hand, you know, you can have a condominium with <coughs> three bedroom, 600,000, while you have a pod, which is the same three bedroom, but can only sell for 400,000 because it is not a pod and it therefore pays 20,000 in taxes as opposed to the seven in taxes that the other $600,000 three bedroom house does. Here again, the, the distinction of condominiums is a legal one. Condominium I, I is a, is a form of ownership. I, I understand. Let me, let me finish the answer. Let me, let me finish the answer. A condominium is a legal form of ownership. And whether we would agree or not, the bottom line is that homestead, as it is presently written, only has, a spec, only has additional language relative to condominiums. There is nothing in there that addresses PUDs. So essentially, I would say that the units that are in PUDs would be treated the way any other single family residence would be, with the distinction that where in a PUD there are certain circumstances, like you said, a private road that has to be maintained by the owners, maybe similar to a condo association, they're responsible for garbage or the support of certain services that say a comparable one family home would not, that's going to be reflective and should be reflective in the selling price of those units. That goes back to what Melissa was saying is how you would really have to look, how Tyler as appraisers would be looking at what drives the value in each of those units. And to the degree possible, you would be looking at units that sell within the same complex so they have the similar or the same kinds of influences on value. But relative to I, homestead, I but relative to homestead, they are not considered condominiums for homestead. I understand the legal definition. I, I, what, what my question arises to is for a single family home of 600000 that has to pay, let's say, $20,000 in taxes, comparable to a condo that sells for 650000 and pays $9,000 income versus homestead, yeah. but a PUD, because it is not in the old-fashioned law book where you could distinction condominiums being rentals uh, or as income, and homeowners single family fee simple being a homestead, you now have this product that's literally sandwiched in between the two, where you're caught in the land of full taxes as a homestead in addition to exceptional services. And I understand that you're trying to say that sales value, can, and I understand that taxes are ad valorem, based on value. Yep. But I just gave you an example where based on value just proves to you that it doesn't work. Well, yes and, and no. Yes and no. What I think you, what I think, excuse me, what I think you may be forgetting here is that's why the town is potentially going to look at the homestead option. I am, in no way, I am in no way suggesting the town will adopt it because at this point, no one could honestly say whether that is appropriate, whether it's a good fit for the town. If, hypothetically, the town were to adopt it, that would have an effect on what you're observing about the sales of condominium properties. Because again, part of the reason, quite honestly, that many condominiums sell to the values they do is the lower tax burden they have relative to a general one-family home of about the same value. Again, this is all kind of the cart before the horse because we don't know whether ultimately 
the town will find Homestead to be an appropriate option. There are a lot of a aspects of Homestead. So again, all that could be reasonably said at this point in time is that when the folks from Tyler do their work, <coughs> they're going to be looking at developing both income and market values for condominiums. So the analysis to determine whether Homestead is a good fit can reasonably be done. Again, all of the properties, whether they are single family homes or whether they are FUDs, are going to have to have market values developed for them on the information specific to each property, or in the case of FUDs, the specifics relative to the influences or the, the circumstances that each unit owner has to bear. You're welcome. <laughs> While you're coming up, I'm just going to talk a little bit because this comes up a lot. Um, condo owners often complain that they don't receive the same level of services as other property owners because they have to pay a fee for their maintenance of roads and that type of thing. And I can tell you that we only consider the sale prices. We assume that when people purchase condominiums that they're aware of those additional fees and they choose to pay that amount uh, anyway. We don't because the amount of services someone receives is a taxation issue. We are only motivated by what people purchase them for. So whether or not the services, we don't take a, a deduction because you have to pay for that. Um, so it's strictly market value. But go ahead. I do agree with you on that. Okay. Um, the one thing I would say though is the one thing, one of the things that affects the market value of a condo is <coughs> we decide the whole services. One of the things that affects the market value is that the taxes are lower. When you come up with your hypothetical market value, yep. uh, which may be used under the homestead situation, are you going to take into effect that at the same time, were we to go to a homestead situation, the taxes would go up and therefore the market price might be down. As you guys were talking about that, that's exactly what was running through my head. The answer is no, but I think it's an interesting concept that the reassessment itself may actually impact the market. Yes. Because, um, you know, right now there are probably inequities, and you may know where they are. Um, and, and so there, there will be shifts between school districts, high-level properties, low-level property commercials, that I think that it, it, there's a great potential that this reassessment will impact the market. And if you continue to reassess either on a, some kind of cyclical basis, whether it be one year, two year, three year, that would be the way to address that. By doing these more frequently, you're over time, a very short period of time really, you'll be able to smooth that out and, and you'll be able to um, you know, react to it rather than kind of put something in place for the next 10, 50, whatever years that people have to live with. So it is an interesting conundrum, so to speak. But we can't, because we we don't have a crystal ball. We can't, we're not gonna know what the decision is on the homestead until our values are already set. And, and I think that that's probably set up that way specifically, to be honest. So, uh, you know, that that's my comment on that. So, do you more reason. I just want to add to that, that in the free market, the market will show what the values are, and the market will correct itself just as it has done after this uh, recession. Yep. So eventually the effect that taxation has on property, we will be able to analyze it and read it from the market data. Uh, just like taxation in municipalities, that has a tremendous effect on values of commercial property, for example, because then they're not able to make as much income. So eventually, as Melissa indicated, the free market will allow us to read and interpret and we will be able to determine what the new market values are. So either you have to do another reassessment a couple of years later or expect a significant increase in the, in the challenges after this. <coughs> well, the intent is to maintain the role and do adjustments every year and then a cyclical reassessment 
not 40 or 50 years, but uh, uh, the state recommends six years uh, cycle four, four, or four years cycle four. But I, I just want to point out that part of that whole analysis at the end, of, part of that whole analysis at the end of it will be to listen to everyone, to listen to the condo owners, to listen to the HUD, which is something that we you know, I know, I'm learning a lot myself about the different kinds of housing that there is, to listen to everybody before we make that evaluation. So I just don't, it's not a done deal or anything like that. So I just want everyone to know that. It's very important that we collect all the information and then we can all analyze it and and as everybody knows, we have town hall meetings every six weeks, and this will be one of the main discussions through that whole time period. <coughs> uh, so you mentioned before about. Oh, I didn't. Okay. You want to start? No, I have a question. I have a question. You people in the neighborhood with the people coming You need to say your question into the mic, sir. Get closer to the mic. To look at a neighborhood, how the people maintain the house, they cut the grass, like. I live is a house which is going up. They want to decrease by a by by valuation. By by the house? Possibly. It's hard for me to stand here and say that. I, I mean it has to be pretty extreme. I think that this is one of those things that because you look at it every single day, uh, you know, it's probably bothers you a lot more than maybe someone who's driving down the street. Uh, it's really a matter of of extremes. There are properties that absolutely, you know, they tons of garbage, and it's an easy thing. If, if it's something that our appraisers recognize, then... Well, the house is full of property. Yeah, I mean, it, it very well... That's what I my, uh, my, my new assessment. I, I'm not... You'll hold me to it. Now I need this a room for my house. Yeah. I, I just can't say whether or not... I mean, we, we look at everything. We look at everything that could possibly affect value, and I'm sure we'll have sales of properties next to a house that's yeah, similar to that, and we'll, we'll analyze that. Yeah. But, um, you know, if you can put a fence up and then not see your neighbor, uh, you know, that may be, it really depends on how bad it is. I also need to move, I'm going to move this week. That's going to raise the value of the house. We consider, I mean, there's normal, typical maintenance for a house. I, I mean, if you own a house, you get to replace the roof every 20 years. Does that mean, Increase the property. If I was making an adjustment because your roof was caving in and I put your property in poor condition and you replace that roof, <coughs> then yeah, it would increase the value. But if your house is, you know, just maintained to normal condition and you replace the roof, that's considered typical maintenance. It's average. I just want to add to my question that, of course, uh, a neighborhood where there is a state of disrepair and garbage flying all over the place will not be uh, desirable. And the market values will reflect that. And when we are able to measure those values, it will reflect that, that neighborhood. Just like most people do not want to buy in an area, on a main road, for example, because of the traffic. The market values will show that. A residential house on a double yellow line road will have less value than a single family in a nice cool de sac of course. But when it comes to condition uh, and neighborhood conditions such as you described, of course, that will be reflected on the mark on the sale of similar properties in the area. And Fernando, please elaborate because we have some small little yellow line roads. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's like if if you if you were like number of roads. Yeah, <laughs> that's usually my first. Yeah, I mean we, we take traffic <laughs> count, um, you know, not not traffic at lunchtime, but you know traffic all the time. I live on on one of those roads, and my house was built in the early 1800s, so it's very, very close to the road, and I'm very sympathetic to that because Christmas Day is the only day of the year that I don't have a car going by my house every second of the day, so I'm very sympathetic to that. Um, so you know that typically. Come to the mic, please. Yes. Um, would you happen to know, uh, percentage-wise, how many condos there are as compared to homes? <coughs> we have uh, we have approximately fifteen hundred condominium union units uh, out of uh, maybe 
1831 <laughs> condominium units are a single family home, two tenth class, 5294. Yes, but okay. classified as single family homes, just yes, regular. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have a property tax bill in our hands right now that's going to be due the end of April. And on that tax bill, there's a little statement that says your property has been assessed at X amount of dollars right, for, for, uh, for marketing purposes, I guess. Can you explain how that was arrived at? Because this is on the property tax uh, information stuff that we get any time there's a possible in, in, involvement with our taxes. Which, is, which includes that, equal, that infamous equalization, right? On every tax bill, the one that you received recently, which was your uh, 2014 town and county taxes and special district, you have the estimated market value, which would be a real number, like 245,000, for example. And you will also see the assessed value on top, uh, which the assessed value multiplied by the rate will give you the total taxes for the town or county, etc. Also there is the equalization rate. If you take the assessed value and you divide it by the equalization rate, which uh, the, the most the one utilized on your recent tax bill is 6.29, you will get the full market value. So currently, uh, all of our properties are assessed at a uniform percentage of value, and that uniform percentage is 6.29. So your assessed value represents 6.29% of your full market value of your property. So most people are already at, at a lot of people Uh, yes. They've kept up with their permits and they've kept up with the... Yes, more or less. About a third would be their house. The current assets, full uh, market value will be similar to what the full market value uh, that we come up with after the revaluation. Once we adopt the 16 law, which will be utilized for your 2017 taxes, you will not see the equalization rate anymore. You will only see one value the full market value, since the role will be at 100%. Okay, so you had mentioned before about web mailers, um, so this is a follow-up to actual visits to the house. Does every residence get a web mailer, or only the people where they were visited and, and access was gained? Because it would seem to me that everyone should get one so that then people might challenge it, and then they say, and then you would turn around and say, okay, well then let us in, and we'll verify. Everyone receives a data mailer. So, um, and and on that data mailer, it will indicate whether or not we gained entry into your house. And <coughs> we do require, if you tell me that you have a finished basement and I didn't have it, I'll believe you. And if you tell me that you don't, I won't. <laughs> so I apologize for that. So we do verify that the information that you give us on a data mailer is correct. If we're able to verify that information from the exterior, if you tell me my shed fell down, we'll verify that without making an appointment. The data mail will request a phone number, and if you do make a change that affects the value, we will request that you allow us to verify it, and if you do not allow us to do that, we will not make that change. We'll have many more meetings, so uh, I hope to see you all again. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, there will be many more meetings. We, can, we will come to any group, uh, any 
religious organization, club, anything you want us to come and talk about. You might want to wait till the process starts. Um, and so we need to adjourn uh, into a uh, special meeting for a few minutes. So uh, we want to thank you for coming tonight. Is there any other questions that anyone wanted to ask this evening, or are we pretty full from that information? Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, we look forward to uh, having um, getting lots of information and uh, hearing from our residents. I want everyone to remember, especially to the TV, the people on TV, we will do this again on April 29th, Tuesday. I'm going to tell Melissa Tuesday, April 29th, and. Um, and we hope you can join us there because there might be different questions that are being asked. And if you have any questions and you want to send them to me and we can ask them if you can't come that evening, it's sdonnelly at townofosting.com. So if you send us your questions, we'll surely get them answered on camera that night. Okay? And uh, so we look forward to... Uh, uh, I want to remind everyone that the town of Austin is a very open office. Even Fernando's office is, is an open office. Uh, we do suggest you make an appointment if you want to talk to them, since they get busier and busier all the time. So I would like a, an adjournment into a special meeting. If, uh, motion, motion to adjourn to a special meeting. All those in favor? Aye. Just turn it off for a second. Do you want me to read it? I think we're harder. Present. Councilmember Jeffrey. Present. Councilmember Blanca. Present. Councilmember Wilshire. Present. Supervisor Donnelly. Present. Are there any um, public comments on the agenda items this evening? I just want to make one comment on it. Sure. Uh, this is a very short. We had uh, we have uh, seasonal workers in our parks department and. Uh, we had two young men that decided that this was not the job for them for the summer, and we uh, we're going to have so we're going to have two terminations already and one appointment. And I want to thank uh, Maddie for all the hard work she does because every time we hire someone, whether they get seasonal, part time, or full time, it's a tremendous amount of work that goes into hiring each and every person. Madam Clerk, letter A personnel parks department termination resolved. Town Board of the Town of Austin hereby terminates the seasonal employment of Ramel Dubois, effective April 10, 2014. Do I have a motion? So moved. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Letter B, personnel, Parks Department termination resolved with the Town Board of the Town of Austin hereby terminates the seasonal employment of Chamel Edwards, effective April 10, 2014. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Letter C, Personnel Parks Department Seasonal Appointment Resolve with the Town Board of the Town of Austin hereby appoints Cameron Bell of Austin to the seasonal position of laborer in the Town Parks Department effective April 14, 2014 at a rate of $8.25 per hour. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Adjourn into uh, no. adjourn. Yeah. Yeah. Do I have a motion? Just, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. She's so moved. <laughs> All those in favor? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed. So that uh, ends our town hall meeting and special meeting for uh, April 15, 2014. We are in the middle of a very uh, uh, holiday season for all for many, many people, and for those who don't uh, celebrate a holiday at this time frame, uh, it is spring, even though we're supposed to get snow tonight. So I want everyone to be careful on the roads, and I want everyone to have a joyous and uh, happy holiday. And we will see you next Tuesday, uh, the 22nd, at uh, April 22nd, at the courthouse for a regular legislative uh, session. Closing in memory. And we're going to close in memory of Estelle Dashman, who uh, was a um, lifelong us person from Austin, and uh, she left town a few years ago to live with a, her, her daughter, her son and daughter. And uh, so uh, we just take a moment of silence.
Thank you very much and have a great day.